Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you know, I'm sure, we are studying this, the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is the series for the first three months of 2013. And this series of lessons is entitled Origins. We're doing Lesson 12 in that series entitled Creation and the Gospel. This is the lesson for March 23 of 2013. We like to encourage you to get your Bibles out. Let's study this together. And before you do that, however, let's offer a word of prayer together. Our kind and loving Father, once again we thank you for your divine presence as we study together your word. As we look at this particular lesson, which is very significant in its implications, may we be able to comprehend all that you have to say to us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Creation and the Gospel. This lesson will focus on the relationships, the similarities, and some possible differences between the original creation, of course that would be back at Creation Week, and God's ability to create in us a new heart. You remember the passage by David in Psalm 51.10. When we talk about the death of Jesus and what it accomplished, we tend to use a lot of cliches. What does it mean to say, Jesus became sin for us? 2 Corinthians 5.21 in, in some translations. We know for certain that Jesus did not actually become a sinner. What's the difference between becoming sin and becoming a sinner? I would, it looks <laughs> to me like Je the f God, or the Father treated Jesus as if he was a sinner. Okay. He was not, he, w he didn't sin. But uh, you want to know what God's going to do to the sinners? In keeping with Romans 1 and so forth, uh, the Father just let him go. Mm -hmm. Jesus was hanging on the cross. He didn't say, Father, why are you beating me up or burning me up or torturing me? He says, why have you let me go? I mean, God just letting you go, that can't be too serious, can it? Deadly fatal. Deadly, yeah. Deadly fatal. Well, our Bible study guide uses these words. By his death, Jesus restored the relationship between God and humanity that had been broken by the sin of Adam and Eve. Restored the relationship. How does the death of Christ restore a relationship? That sounds like healing. Well, and the obvious question is, how does the death of, of Jesus restore this, this relationship? We're talking about the death. Now, we're not talking about the life. We're talking about the death of Jesus. How does the death of Jesus restore a relationship? Well, is it, oh, is it because Jesus was willing to do the Father's will, even if it meant death? Does it have something to do with Jesus' willingness? Okay, well, you know that some groups down through time have, have taken this in a very mystical sense, meaning that, you know, somehow or other, even though we live, you know, 2,000 years later, that our spirits or our souls or something else like that were, were mystically combined with Jesus and that we died to sin in his body and therefore that's why it's, God is able to save us because we've already died uh, to sin long, long ago. Now, Roman, some Romans 5.10 says, For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We're talking about this, Jesus' that's, death. That's the point right there. Now, if, uh, I think that we should really take the assumption that prior to Jesus' death, we really made, uh, some people didn't have a relationship. Mm -hmm. And you can't reconcile if you weren't already in a, in a state of conciliation. Am I making sense or? Mm -hmm. Well. We, we, uh, no, we use that, uh, if the, but is the, is the word that is translated as reconciled, uh, is reconciled the proper word for the, for the Greek? The, the well, let's. Reconcile means to, to bring, bring together, to, bring two people and together. And that has to do with healing. Yeah. Okay. And well, at in fact, we're reconciles saved. at one moment okay. in, in, in its That's original right. meaning. Okay. okay. Uh, other people would say that the blood of Jesus paid a legal penalty. No. I think that there was a debt that was owed. God says you mustn't sin, but if you do sin, there's a debt to be paid. And Jesus came and he paid the debt, and therefore we're home. Pagan teaching. 
Is that okay. why some preachers today sell a little piece of Jesus' robe or maybe they put a little drop of blood in a vial and send it to you for some financial donation? Oh, wow. And the little drop of Jesus' blood? Well, now, I haven't heard of that one before. That's a, that's a good one. Well, there, there might be something to the paying of the price. Mm -hmm. It may not be exactly what comes out on the surface, but I remember my grandmother saying to my aunt when she was a little girl, do not stick your finger in the light socket, mm -hmm. you know, because they you took the light out. You pay the price. <laughs> and she did. She just couldn't help it. She did, and she got zapped. But what if the mother would say, now, don't put your finger in the light socket, and then she does it. She jumps back. It hurts. Mm -hmm. And then she shows the little girl, look what they did to my finger. There would be burn on it, maybe, maybe some blood, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And she, the little girl would go, yeah, well, I'm not going to stick my finger in there. There are some little girls who will stick their finger in there anyway. Well, <laughs> yeah, that, that could be. I just don't understand how she could after that. Yeah. But um, anyway, uh, there is a price that the mother took by sticking her finger in there. Mm -hmm. So in that case, is a, there's a price to show her daughter something. Mm -hmm. True. So. But I think it's helpful to kind of go back and try to understand what was, impl what was implied at the very beginning. Yeah. When he was in discussion with the with the serpent. with the serpent in the tree, she was in her mind having to contend with, do I believe my creator, or is this creature in the tree giving me more information that mm -hmm. uh, and so she had to make a decision for or against her creator. Mm -hmm. She decided again. She mm -hmm. decided to transfer her faith and love from her creator to the creature in the tree and, and follow his bidding in hopes of having something better happen. And all of us have been doing the same ever since. In that process, she and Adam lost their connection with divinity. Mm -hmm. They used to be able to talk with God in the garden and that disappeared. The issue that Satan says is humanity can't do what God wants you to do. Mm -hmm. So Jesus basically said, I'll become a human. I have, I have a connection with divinity. I can talk with my father. And I will come down and I will go through everything the devil can throw at me. And I will depend upon my father. And by doing that successfully, he did. Now he has a right to give us a connection with the father through him. Mm. Our humanity can be hooked back up with divinity through Jesus. And we can be brought back to sons and daughters of God. Mm -hmm. And the whole death a whole life and death is what it took mm -hmm. to do that. And you need to have both of those to be. You effective. have to have both of them. You know, there is a lot of power in calling somebody a liar. I mean, even calling God a liar. I just thought about this the other day when I was going through the, the um, cafeteria line. Somebody came with their um, their little tray thing closed and she she told the cashier exactly what she had in there now what if I would have said uh-uh she's got more than that what do you think the cashier is going to do probably felt like it was necessary to open up and look that's right and um, in a way that that power happened then when Satan called God a liar mm -hmm. yeah well <clears throat> Is it possible that the death of Christ teaches us some kinds of lessons about Satan versus God versus the Father that makes it more possible for us to relate to God? Sure. Satan 
instigated people to whip and punish their creator and he caused people to do things that if the people had thought it out they wouldn't have done and sometimes I think in life we can react to people who cause us to do bad things that we would normally not do mm -hmm. and I think that that's satanic is Satan is an instigator he won't do the dirty work but he'll get you to do the dirty work and I think we see I don't want anything to do with a being that uses people to create to 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 uh, torture and kill their creator what, what do you think was more difficult, getting back to our original question, which do you think would be more difficult? Now, none of us have the power to create life out of de novo, so this is sort of a hypothetical question. Which do you think would be more difficult, to create Adam and Eve de novo, or to take a sinner and create a, a new heart, a clean, a, clean, a, you know, clean heart, a new right spirit in him? I don't know which is harder for divinity. It takes divinity to do either one. Mm -hmm. I think it's harder to clean up a mess mm -hmm. than to create, um, especially a self-willed human that you want to give them freedom of choice. That is a very difficult thing you have to, to create mm -hmm. love in a person. You have to deal with um, Someone who has a choice and may not agree with you. You know, if you look on the internet, that's probably the number one sales tactic, is this will create love in the one that you want to love you, and this will create love. And so products are being sold on that very problem that God has to do is have humans love him voluntarily. Why is that question interesting to you? The one about... Which is harder, to create yeah. de novo or to well, create a new heart? Because our lesson here is, is basically the issue here is, is if we believe in salvation, God has to create new hearts and right spirits in us. That's right. And if he's going to do that, how can we say he didn't create in the beginning? He That's would, what the issue well, is. But in the beginning, that, that new creature did not have the opportunity to exercise choice. No. And so every creature has to have the, op every intelligent creature has to have the capacity to exercise choice. Mm -hmm. And that's, the angels in heaven had that capacity. S and a third are, are living among us right now. So you're, you're identi or using the new heart mm -hmm. as evidence that he created in the first place. Yes. Oh, okay. Exactly. Gotcha. You know, what came to my mind when you asked that question was the two, the two armies. You had the, the, the new army, and then you have the battle-hardened army, mm -hmm. which is the strongest. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, you know, the, the recreation may come out better than one that just came about. Well, they'd be more through. like God, because mm -hmm. if you're going to be like God, you will know, know good and evil. Well, yeah. Genesis 3. Yep. Now they're like one of us. But, but um, it, it, it sounds said. kind of positive that way. Maybe it is positive. Well, we know. have it's an expanded that. understanding about God. If evil had never begun, intelligent creatures would not have understood the infinite, even begin to approach the infinite. They would have just been somewhat static. And the infinite one could only create intelligent creatures that had the capacity to choose. Capacity to choose, got to have the opportunity to I could have I could have lived my whole life without knowing evil. I would have been <laughs> very happy, and I don't think that's we need to work. know evil in order to be fulfilled. I think that's the fulfilled. way God intended it to be. Sure, of, of that's course. the way it was intended to be. Yeah, but after you've been flaw. slapped around and freedom being you know, what it is, it didn't work out that way. Mm. And here's a question for you. You know, we look at Eve and we say, you know, she was the one who sinned. Okay, Eve sinned after being clearly deceived. She didn't realize. Now, she knew it was wrong to eat the fruit. Now, not, not arguing about that a bit. God had clearly said she wasn't supposed to eat it. She was deceived. She thought, really, the serpent had something to offer. She took the fruit to Adam. He did not hear the serpent. He did not hear the devil's voice. He did not hear his arguments, which probably were fairly extensive, more than what we have recorded in Scripture. And he said, give it to me. 
So who sinned worse, Eve or Adam? Adam chose Eve over God. Well, that may be a difference in the sin right there. It's just a difference. They may still be the both the same. One is sin that comes through ignorance, which was what happened to Eve. The sin that came through Adam is a sin of misplaced values. Either one, wasn't it? East, well, well, you know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. Eve over God. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, not, so not, if you really think about it, those two sins may not be, one may not be uh, higher than the other. On the other hand, you could say Eve's sin was unintentional and Adam's sin was very intentional. But his values were messed up. Well, she had to decide yeah, she to was. doubt her creator yes. before she took the apple. <laughs> she was intentional. And Adam had to do that too. And yeah, they, Adam in that had sense, to, they're the same. Adam had to make the decision <clears throat> for which is most valuable, Eve God did, or Eve. Eve right. did two That's things. Right. She I left agree. Adam's side and she uh, listened to the serpent. So she did two things. Okay, what happened next is recorded in Genesis 3. L look at starting with verse 8. If you have your Bibles, we would encourage you to join us. I'm reading from the Good News Bible, the American Bible Society version. That evening, they heard the Lord God walking in the garden, and they hid from him among the trees. But the Lord God called out to the men, Where are you? <laughs> now, if God is omnipresent, how could he ask such a question? Well, you can look at it this way, too. He could have been asking them the question, where are you? Mm -hmm. Where were they? I mean, he, he's asking them Well, he, he, they just sinned. Where are they? Mm -hmm. So you're saying, are you in sin? Or are you with me? Or are you with the devil? Or where are you? Sure. So well, you he, can look at it that way, too. He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid and hid from you because I was naked. That's Adam answering. Who told you that you were naked? God asked. Did you eat the fruit that I told you not to eat? The man answered, The woman you put here with me gave me the fruit, and I ate it. The Lord asked the woman, Why did you do this? She replied, The snake tricked me into eating it. Then the Lord God said to the snake, You will be punished for this. You alone of all the animals must bear this curse. From now on you will crawl on your belly, and you will have to eat dust as long as you live. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head, and you will bite her offspring's heel. So then, now they know where they are. Okay. <laughs> what do we learn from God's approach to Adam and Eve on that occasion? I think that uh, God is very, very kind and generous to us. I think that, of course, he's omnipresent, so he was treating them very childlike. You know, where are you? And he, he knows everything. And I, I'm not sure, you know, Adam, Eve, you know, they both sinned, obviously. But I think because they did not have all of that knowledge, that they were very childlike. And, and certainly the Bible teaches us that we knew before the creation of the world that man would fall and this plan of salvation was already laid out. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think um, it, they were very childlike. And yes, mm -hmm. they were guilty. Yes, they did wrong. But God laid out this beautiful plan for us, which included us. But it's very interesting in here uh, where Adam kind of blames God. Mm -hmm. Eve know? blames God. And uh, well, both well, of them blame yeah, God. Adam said, the woman that you put here with me. And uh, so it's kind of, they're very childlike. And I think that today, even with all the knowledge that we have, and we're very sophisticated, and we know so many things, I think we're very childlike too. And I'm, I'm so grateful to the Lord that He forgives us again and again. Well, there's two. There, God had three choices, and we'll think about these as we move along. He could have said, "You know, I warned you. I told you exactly what would happen. You sinned. Okay, that's it, <laughs> and they're dead." <laughs> Or he could have said, well, every, every parent says to their child. What would have been the, the results of that, that well, scenario? I mean, it's pretty obvious that the be rest of the beings in the universe would look at that and say, whoa, look what happens if you get out of line. Yeah. So exactly. there would have been fear yeah. in heaven right. and love taken out of the equation. 
So that yeah. wasn't a very good option. Right. Ellen White says that if we worship God out of fear, it will lead to a sullen submission, which leads to the character of a rebel. Well, another choice is to do what we always do with our kids, saying, you know, I'm sorry, I know you're, you're just a beginner, and we don't usually apologize to them. We usually punish them and say, you're never going to do that again kind of thing. And then we let, them, we, let, we let them stay in the house. That's discipline. That's discipline. Okay. Couldn't God use time. a little discipline? Yeah, he is. He did. <laughs> he, he, kicked, he kicked them out of the garden, but he went out with them. Mm -hmm. He made the clothes for them. He did all the things for them. Okay. You asked, why did he call? I think that he was trying to, to let them know that he wasn't angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, a, as a father would call, mm -hmm. like maybe he had done before. Mm -hmm. uh, let's have a chat. And they had sinned. They were, they were hiding. They were afraid. And a friendly call might have been to kind of defuse that. Mm -hmm. Um, the other possibility is what God did. He said, there are so many important things for you to learn here that I can't let that either one of those things happen right now. We have to delay. And we're, we're gonna, we'll come back to that, but think about that. Is that the only reason why he delayed? He had something to learn? That's probably the main reason. Yeah, but... Uh, I mean, not just us. We're talking about we the whole universe. Okay. But what about Adam and Eve? Did all of them. All of, all of them and all of us. Well, the, the learning part would lead to salvation, wouldn't it? Hopefully. It doesn't for most people, but it should. Well, it, it, it was there to be played out. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's kind of the reason, isn't it? Not, not just that we know how we have something to learn, but that because what? Well, the learning possibility something does of have consequences. salvation will be played out. Sure. Yeah, and we're talking about what's the, that's what we're discussing. We're discussing what is the basis of that, of that salvation. Right. Now, if we go to the book of James, which of course is thousands of years later, what's the reason why most of us commit most of our sins? Because we want to. Do you remember James 1, 13 to 15? If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say this temptation comes from God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. Then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So that's the way most of us commit our sins on a regular basis. Well, some fairly radical changes, and this is something that uh, I suppose it's difficult for creationists to talk about, but we, they need to be aware of it. Some fairly radical changes have happened to the environment of the earth as a result of Adam and Eve's sin. We, do, we try to say all the changes that happened must have happened in connection with the flood. No. Look at this. This is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 61, paragraph 5. In humility and unutterable sadness, they bade farewell to their beautiful home and went forth to dwell upon the earth, where rested the curse of sin. The atmosphere, once so mild and uniform in temperature, was now subject to marked changes, and the Lord mercifully provided them with a garment of skins as a protection from the extremes of heat and cold. When did that happen? When they left the garden. When they left the garden, when they sinned. Is that? Is that really a marked change on what was outside of the garden? Or is that well, it, moving from the garden to the outside? We don't know. We just know that that's, yeah. You're saying that may, you know, are you saying that the garden had some kind of artificial heating system? Well, I'm, I'm just asking, did the change, was there a change on the outside or was the change always there, but they it moved from the It says here the, the atmosphere. I'm assuming they were, believing that they, were, they were breathing the same atmosphere in the garden as outside. Because it says, once so mild and uniform a temperature, that would be inside, right? Was now subject to marked change. It's talking about the same atmosphere. You know, sometimes when a little kid does something, there's consequences. Or like, you know, he'll pull a, maybe a fruit off the bottom of a stack in the grocery store, and uh-oh, he watches everything go down. 
Adam and Eve must have watched the atmosphere, the world around them, and go, uh-oh, we really did something here because mm -hmm. everything just came tumbling apart. The animals started eating each other, the roses, the flowers, some of them got thorns. I mean, things just changed. Mm -hmm. Sin did something to the world. And Genesis that's all based on just that little bit there. Well, that's one, I mean, that's one of the clearest places, so that's why I quoted Besides that. Besides the, the groaning thing. Mm -hmm. no, well, look at Genesis 3.21. And the Lord God made clothes out of animal skins for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. So now they need animal skins. Now, you know, I've always wondered about this, and I've never been brave enough to ask, but now you get, you get to be, you get to answer my questions. Oh, Ken, I, I apologize. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're going off on to something else, but what you just said, so... An animal died here. Well, it let's seems talk about that, that. Okay. Let's talk about that. Uh, uh, the lesson makes quite a big point of the fact that Adam must have offered, had to offer sacrifice, and then God probably took the skins and made clothes out of them, probably from the sacrifices. That's a bit of a problem for several reasons. One, did God ask him to kill a whole bunch of animals? There's, not, there's no way one lambskin is going to be enough clothing for Adam and Eve. So that provides a problem. Either Why you, is that a problem? Well, how many animals do you have to kill for a sacrifice? Well, why, why would how many, God have how to many animals do you need to kill for, for clothing? Probably why, why six God, or eight. Why would well, God why have couldn't to kill anyone, any of the animals at all? He created well, the animals. He created the skins. And that's the question. But why see, he create it without an animal? The people who want to make a big deal out of the sacrifice, they say God must have killed animals or he must have instructed Adam to kill animals so that he could make skins. But that's not the end of it. What did he actually do? I mean, what do you have to do to skins to make them decent for clothes? If you leave them out in the ordinary atmosphere, within, within a day or two, they're hard and brittle. Either that or, they, or the critters are eating them up and you got holes in them. So did God dry the skins and treat the skins and tan the skins and said, okay, here's the tan skins? Did he teach? I mean, and if, if that was God's plan for Adam and Eve to do that in the future, I mean, did he set up the first tanning process? I mean, this is a, I mean, it's easy to say, oh yeah, I just gave them skins. That's a, that's a complicated business. But, but I don't understand. What are you, what are you trying to, it, what, what is the question that you're trying to answer here? Well, traditionally, what we say is, where did he get the skins? He must have killed some animals. Okay, that, that's proof of the fact that the first sacrifices were made right there. Ellen White says, yes, the first sacrifices were made right there. She doesn't say that the skins were used for the clothing, but she says, yes, the sacrifices were made there, just outside the garden. Yeah. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. But I'm, what I am saying is this. It's, it's you know, people who, who say, yeah, God killed the animal. He took the skin. He made clothes for them. It's not just like that, that human being, now God, of course, can do anything. He could have created animal skins without, without ever killing an animal. I mean, let's, let's admit that. But the process of making clothing out of animal skins is a fairly complicated process so, under normal circumstances. So you're saying that just because it was said so, so shortly in the Bible that... I'm saying the way it's there? usually explained. The way... Th what's explained? That well, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of, oh... They killed the animals, they offered the sacrifices, God took the skins, made clothes for them. Just okay. like that. Yeah, as opposed to what? Well, if you do that, I mean, I don't, I'm just, I, don't, what, I don't know what you're missing. If you do that, very quickly the skins, at least the skins we have now, will become hard and brittle and completely unacceptable to be skins. So you're to be, saying, to be clothing. You're saying, okay. So you're saying that just because it, the process wasn't named in the Bible here that they didn't do the process? I, I'm saying that God may have done the process, but that, I mean, one set of animal clothes is not enough. Is, is, did he teach Adam and Eve how to do tanning? I have a question. Yeah. Sacrifices, they were burned whole. They weren't skinned. In some cases. Well, in, in yeah. the, you, in that's the true. service of, of the Israelites yeah. later. Yeah. Yes. They weren't skinned and the meat just thrown on and the hides mm -hmm. That's done some, somewhere point. else. You know. So God could have then um, had them sacrifice an animal, 
but miraculously uh, uh, mm -hmm. created the skins that went over Adam and Eve because doesn't say that just though. Meant because creating the skins is a multi-day process. Mm -hmm. So he had to do something. Oh, creating quickly. clothing out of skins. But, yeah, but, creating. But why, then, then how would Adam know how to do more clothes, like for the children and things like that? Exactly. He could always learn later. <laughs> well, but it's a process. Yeah, but why? But the the point and, and the lesson goes on. And the reason I'm bringing this up because the lesson goes on and say, well, you know, here they are wearing the skins of these animals. What did it make them think? Did, did Adam think, okay, here I'm wearing this this death mask in effect? because I had to kill this animal to get this skin. Did it, did it remind him of God's promise of a plan of salvation? Uh, what, did, what, did the animal, what did Adam and Eve think wearing this skin? That, that, the lesson oh, goes I on. Could, uh, yeah, I see what you mean now. Perhaps, per, I'm sorry, Gary, go ahead. That, that every time they would see their clothes, that now they would, it would remind them what, would, what yeah. had happened. Okay. And perhaps over the several day period of time, of making these clothes, Adam and Eve f still felt the shame of being naked or, or at least partially naked as they hid themselves with leaves or whatever. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the tanning process was accelerated. But I do, I do believe that this sacrifice showed the coming salvation and the Lamb of God being sacrificed. And the fact that sin innocent leads to life. death. It shows that sin leads to death. Yes. Well, one of the most important points in all of this that we sometimes jump right over and don't, don't talk about, although we sort of know it in the back of our minds, that only God can give life. Now, modern scientists have tried in all sorts of ways to try to, to figure out how to reproduce life. They can't even reproduce life, I mean, even though they have the pattern sitting in front of us. Okay, this is the way you do it. Say, okay, th this is the way God did it. Here it is. Let's see if we can reproduce it. They can't. Nobody has ever made even one cell, the smallest cell, a bacteria. Nobody, no human being has yet created a bacteria that was a Bible. Something about breathed into it the breath of life, isn't it? Hmm. The best they can do is a robot. Yeah, well, they're working on that. Well, there is one thing. They can kind of spread it around like fire. Well, what we, have, what we have discovered is very effective ways of killing people. Well, that's true, but I'm talking about <laughs> yeah. like, like with um, skin grafts, things yeah. like that, um, yeah. breeding, that kind of thing. But what is, what is special about this life? I mean, I'm, you know, if you could, you know, I, I've seen this and I haven't seen it for a long time, but they used to say, you know, you could, if you took all the chemicals in the human body and separated them out and you made them, put them in little jars or whatever, they'd be worth a few dollars. Okay. 79 cents worth of iron. I see, whatever. Enough for a nail. Well, that, yeah. was, be <laughs> that was before inflation, so I'm not. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway. What's special uh, is that we can think mm -hmm. and determine what we're going ah. to do. But what, the question is, what's the difference between those few bottles of chemicals sitting here, and me. That's the question. The difference is God. Oh. There he was, all made <laughs> out of the dust of the earth. But he wasn't so going we're, anywhere we're until God there. breathed into him the breath of life. And, and then the metabolism began to work, and things began to happen. And he was a living soul. And, every pro and the problem really is this. Let's be, let's be fair. The problem is that God knew how to put every piece. Now, we might be able to reproduce a, a short piece of DNA. We might be able to produce, you know, reproduce some of the proteins. And maybe eventually we can get to a place where we can produce a lot of them. But to put them all together in the right spot and make them work together, that's a completely different story. So we're just common dirt chemicals, and the touch of God makes us into living yeah. souls. Yeah. And then we are arguing, when does the touch of God come for a embryo? You know, and, and well, so that's, that's one of the a, things that people argue about. Yeah. Well, if I it, think if you had all the chemicals lined up there, without the touch of God, you just got a bunch of chemicals laying yeah. there. But if you've got one cell that has the touch that's of functioning, 
-hmm. it has the touch of God in it. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to note in light of that, that only God apparently has the power to give life. We notice in Psalm 59 verse 2, it is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. And what is the result? Now I have a question. Yeah. When God gives a person life, an embryo life, mm -hmm. um, God is again creating out of nothing? Sure. So God is creating something well, out of nothing. <coughs> Technically like speaking. Like when he created the, the, the world, he created something that, out of, by the word. Technically speaking, every one of us, every person who lives on this earth is still a cell line direct from Adam and Eve because there's always been a living cell. The sperm and the egg come together and, they, and there's another person grows up and then they pass along a sperm and an egg or, or sperm or an egg to the next generation and so forth like this. So technically, we are all part of the same living organism. There's not a new d no. de novo creation. No. And by the way, I'd like to add that uh, all of us around the world, we're all winners. Yes. Because we all, we all made it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if anyone gets that, but the Lord everyone knew. on planet Earth is a winner. The Lord, the Lord knew from we the won beginning the, who was going to win. We won the race, huh? We won the race. We won the race. The Lord knew who was who he was going knew, to win. The he race. already knew who was going to win yeah. at the beginning. So. Oh. Now here's another question that comes here: Who tried to explain to Adam and Eve what would happen when they if they ate the fruit? God did before they ate the fruit. Do you remember what we talked about last time? It was the time before. Angels did. Said God had done it, but then he sent two angels down to explain exactly what happened to Satan and all of his friends and what would happen to them. Did those angels not do a good enough job? They did a good job. But I, I tell my children all the time about sugar mm -hmm. and don't have sugar, especially if you're if it's cold or flu season, or you know they like that sugar. <laughs> I think the angels did a good job. I think God did a good job. I think I think we have a problem, and we need God. Well, what's amazing, of course, and people, many people have pointed this out, starting from Paul, uh, back in Romans five, verses six to eleven, that God comes into this situation. He doesn't wait, you know, when, if, if someone wrongs someone else in, in our day, we think, okay, the person who's done wrong, what's he supposed to do? He's supposed to go and apologize for what he did, right? Did God wait for us to apologize? No, no. while we were no yet way. sinners. No, while we were yet yeah. sinners, God jumps right in there and he says, I, I, I realize you don't, even, you, you don't even understand the implications of what you've done. While we were yet sinners, God jumps in and he says, let me, let me, let me see if I can fix this thing. Is there, is there a translation that says, while we were yet enemies, his enemy, okay. and he, he no, came to us? Well, there is I think you, you said that when you read it. Romans 5, verse 5, 10. 10. It's so, something like that. Mm. I think you're right. I mean, you know, there are many ways of looking at this. So he's a very gracious God, very kind, very loving. Sinners he's after RSB us. Enemies. RSB, while we were still enemies, yeah. Well, think about what happens. God came down to this earth, and while we were yet sinners, died on our behalf. That, that's, a, that's a biblical given. It is hard to imagine a better illustration of divine love. Was that the main message God wanted to portray? Is it possible for us to exercise that kind of what we call agape love? Is that even possible for his sinful human beings? There have been humans uh, on this earth and um, people who protect their families, uh, maybe in war or people that rescue people and get killed in the process, they voluntarily do that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe a teacher who shielded, tried to shield the kids from uh, a shooter. Mm -hmm. um, is that the kind of... Well, let's look at a couple things once again from our founding mother, Ellen White. The Scenes of Calvary, this is Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 213. 
the scenes of Calvary call for the deepest emotion. Upon this subject, you will be excusable if you manifest enthusiasm that Christ, so excellent, so innocent, should suffer such a painful death, bearing the weight of the sins of the world, our thoughts and imaginations, imaginations can never fully comprehend. The length, the breadth, the height, the depth of such amazing love, we cannot fathom. And then we ask, what important lessons are we supposed to learn from the experiences of Gethsemane and Calvary? Is it easy for sinful human beings to learn these lessons? And I, this is a quote, from, again, from Desire of Ages 83, paragraph 4. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. A thoughtful hour each day. Does that sound like a, something real easy? Just, oh, yeah, I, I got that figured out in the first hour? No. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be quickened, we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, and all of us are hoping for that, aren't we? Yes. We must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. Once again, Desire of Ages 83. What does penitence mean? That means repentance. Sorry, Sorry for what we've done. Yeah. There's a couple of verses that are, talk about this in the Bible that have interesting, interesting implications. Look at Galatians 3.13. But by becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings. For the scripture says, anyone who's hanged on a tree is under God's curse. But if you look at the place where that came from, Deuteronomy 20, uh, 21 and verses 22 and following, it says there, if someone has been put to death for a crime and his body is hung on a post, it is not to remain there overnight. It must be buried the same day because a dead body hanging on a post brings, God curse, brings God's curse on the land. Bury the body so that you will not defile the land that the Lord your God is giving you. It sounds like the curse comes from leaving the body hanging up overnight. Yes, but they let crucified people usually hang up overnight for several days, right? Did Jesus hang up overnight? No. But that's because they didn't die. He, he died. He died. Mm -hmm. The other two didn't die. They just had broken legs. But yeah, they took them down off the crosses. Yeah. But it's interesting that that statement, I mean, it, you wonder where that idea came from back in the days of Moses because the idea of crucifixion didn't come until the days of the Romans. Oh, that's there interesting. Was, so that was written years before crucifixion. Hundreds, oh, what, 1,500 years before crucifixion was a normal way of wow. killing people. But it's interesting to notice that when, one, when were bodies left on crosses? The destruction jo of Jerusalem. Josephus tells us at the destruction of Jerusalem, the Romans outside performing, the, you know, holding this siege, if someone tried to escape, they almost always were caught, and when they, would, they were caught, they would be crucified in full view of the people inside the, the, the wall, or looking over the wall, they could see them. And they crucified so many people and left them sta hanging there that you couldn't even walk between the crosses. I wonder if that's what God had in mind back there in Deuteronomy 21. Now, are the end times supposed to be worse than yes. the... I mean, we're looking at times that are going to be worse than that. Yes. Well, when you say worse than that, you know, there's a lot of aspects that it could yeah. be worse than. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you couldn't even walk among bodies. They're so thick. How can you get them any thicker? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it's still terrible, but, but yeah. there well, may I mean, be some that's other that's aspects. That scene is scary. And, and you, know that, you know that Ellen White on several occasions makes a very direct, direct comparison between the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very direct comparison on several occasions. Is there a, an account of the destruction of Jerusalem, what happened and what was going on? Because... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking outside of the Bible? Yeah. Yeah. Josephus, Just mainly look Josephus. Look on the internet, there's all kinds of information. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty horrific. You can, we can comprehend what went on there. But we're told 
that there is no way to comprehend how it will be at the end. We just can't conceive of how awful it will be. Worse than anybody yeah. can imagine. Well, right. you know, that just happened in Jerusalem, that what's going to happen in the end is all over the world. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, it's At bigger. least that respect. Well, let, let's look, because we're supposed to be looking back at the cross and talking about the, the salvation. We know that Christ was not a sinner. He never committed a single sin. So what was it that he took upon himself on the cross? Was it the guilt of our sins? Or perhaps the responsibility for our sins, in some sense? Does God take responsibility for sin because he allowed human freedom? Well, God... As I see it, God cannot live with sin. Mm -hmm. And so Christ, all the sins were laid on him, and God had to um, separate himself from Christ because Christ was sin. And it shows that God and sin are like water and oil, just incompatible. Okay. Well, look at these words. This is uh, Desire of Ages 753, first paragraph. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety, now those are precious words in the minds of a lot of people, was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor. It doesn't say he was a transgressor. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. How does that work? I mean, he, obviously he knew he, wasn't, he, he hadn't committed those sins. He knew he wasn't responsible. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the, son of, the soul of his son with consternation. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears. He's bearing what kind of weight? Guilt. Guilt. He cannot see the Father's reconciling face. He cannot see it. Okay? The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior. What happened? The withdrawal, the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Are you saying that Jesus so identified with the human race that he took, he felt the guilt. And when Jesus felt guilty, he could no longer see God. And well, that's what guilt does to us. What, what we, in light of all the scriptures that we have on the subject, I would say, God said, I want you to watch what happens when I separate my my beams of, Ellen White uses this term, my beams of light and love from a human being by the name of Jesus. Watch what happens. Is the separation, is it, is it the sin or is separation the caused result. by sin? The result of sin. The separation but you could almost say that the separation is sin because don't you separate yourself when you sin? Didn't Eve separate herself when she took the apple? Yeah, in, in a sense. It's, I mean, the results are, what you're saying is the results are very closely linked to the cause. I think they're both the same, actually. So um, after we die, when we're facing our judgment or whatever, we will either stay connected to God uh, or God will have to unplug the source of life from us to... He won't want to do it, but we will have chosen to keep our sin in us so God can no longer keep us alive. Is that it? Well, yeah. And what was the terrible agony that Christ suffered in light of your question? From eternity past, think about this, from eternity past, the Father and Son had been one. They had never experienced separation in any sense. But with the death of Jesus, they experienced, and these are Ellen White's words, the sundering of the divine powers. That's manuscript 93, 1899. What does that tell us about the death of the wicked in the end? And sundering means the breakup, the tearing apart. Yeah. 
Many Christians have come to be afraid of God and His judgments while secretly enjoying sin. Is the good news the gospel that Christ has died as our substitute and surety? Did He take our sins upon Himself? The New Testament teaches us that by His death on the cross, Christ will eventually eliminate sin, sinners, and death. But if death was a part of God's way of creating our world in a kind of theistic evolution, how can we say that death is the last enemy? 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Wouldn't that suggest that the ideas of the theistic revolution are in direct opposition to the gospel? Now, I think you need to explain what you just said. Okay. There are those who want to try to somehow pull together the ideas of evolution and creation. And so they say, well, God probably got everything going and then sort of let it develop on its own. Meaning that God's creative plan included a lot of death, you know, the, the superior, the, the more stronger, the what more powerful would destroy the weaker and, you know, survival of the fittest kind of stuff. And then Adam sprung up out of a polywog or something? Whatever. Not directly out of a polywog. He'd have to, sw he'd have to spring up out of an ape or something. Okay. Yeah. So, the, so the, the question is here, you know, in light of all that, um, it, it, looks, it looks like God is using death as a part of the creative process. But the Bible says that death is the last enemy. So it, how can it be a part of the creative process and be the last enemy? It can't. Doesn't look like it. Well, those who believe that, that God the Father, God the Son, and the God the Holy Spirit cooperated in creating our world in the beginning should not have any trouble in believing that they can now recreate us and give us new hearts and right spirits. And of course, the Bible talks about that all the way through from Psalm 51, verse 10, all the way down to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Are you saying that each one of us has the decision that Eve did? Are we going to believe our Creator or are we going to believe whatever kind of serpents are in the world telling us different things? Daily, yeah. moment by moment. I went to a lecture last night at a college and it had a person talking about what happened 10 million years ago. And the person I was with, he said, uh, you know, how can you believe the Bible? And I says, well, because God was there, she wasn't. I mean, you know, I just, <laughs> I just can't believe this, that I'm going to put my future destiny in the hands of this mm -hmm. person I saw. Okay. Now, let's, let's talk about, I mean, we're, we're talking about the gospel and all that's implied by it. Do we believe that God, at the end of the history of this world, will remake us into new creatures? That's what the Bible says. And if he's going to remake us into new creatures in, as 1 Corinthians says, the twinkling of an eye, does that imply that he maybe he could do that back in the beginning? Yes. Wait, I mean, look at all the... Huh? A new creature, but down here we develop a thing called character. Uh-huh. Does he make a new character? No, he doesn't. The way I describe that, and you can say this is simplistic, but it works for me. God preserves our software, but not our hardware. Yeah. He says, I can take you, the software, the, the thinking that comes out of your brain here, and I can preserve that on a disk or whatever form of <laughs> preservation he uses, and then he can give us a brand new body, and he could say, whoop, and he puts that software and that's me. Yep. And then when we ask God to forgive us, we're asking for a reboot. Reboot, please. Reboot. Yeah. <laughs> but we're all for yeah, everybody's still forgiven. the same boot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not a different boot, though. Well, more like uh, wipe the hard drive. Yeah. <laughs> look, at, um, look at one more quotation from Ellen White. New format. Look at what happened at, at, there on Calvary. In that thick darkness, God's presence was hidden. Was he gone? Did he really yeah, separate he himself? From God? He was right there. He makes darkness his pavilion and conceals his glory from human eyes. God and his holy angels were beside the cross. The Father was with his Son. And by the way, who else was there? Holy Spirit. Hmm? Holy Spirit. Satan. And Satan, Satan, with all his angels. They're there, they're there too. This is their, this is their last chance, right? 
yet his presence was not revealed, God's presence was not revealed. Had his glory flashed forth from the cloud, every human beholder would have been destroyed. And in that dreadful hour, Christ was not to be comforted with the Father's presence. He trod the wine press, wine press alone, and the people, and of the people there was none with him. That's Desire of Ages 753 and 754. While we recognize that God's glory was veiled to the point where not even Jesus could detect his presence, every eye in the entire universe outside of this world was glued on what was happening in Gethsemane and on Calvary. Proof? Look at this passage. He was to work no miracle for himself, but angels protected his life till the time came when he was to be betrayed by one of his disciples till he was to give his life on Calvary's cross, and Satan stirred up the minds of men to think that the angels of heaven were indifferent. But every one, how many? Every one. Every one was watching the contest with interest. From the moment that Christ knelt in prayer on the sod of Gethsemane till he died on the cross and cried out, it is finished, the angels and all the universe of God looked on with the greatest interest. Mm -hmm. They knew how important what w it was what was going on right there. And what were we doing? Well, the disciples during the first part of that, they were sleeping. It was, it was late in the day and they needed a little rest. They had just ate and they fell asleep. Yeah. Uh -huh. when and, those and the Lord specifically told them, stay up and watch and wait. When those words were spoken, that it is finished, the plan was completed, the plan whereby Satan's power should be limited and broken and whereby Christ should finally die. And when Christ rose from the dead, his triumph was complete. Satan knew that his battle with Christ was lost, but yet he is at, he is at enmity with God. Manuscript 8, from a very interesting year, 1888. Praise God. Well, if our world was created by haphazard, completely chaotic <coughs> chance process, and there was no supernatural or other logical reason or orderly process involved, then what basis is there for saying that any event that takes place is a sin. I mean, it's completely haphazard. It just happened, God. How can you blame me? Right? Atheists, agnostics, and evolutionists are hoping to avoid any future judgment. And uh, we're running out of time, yeah. so I probably better stop there. I would encourage you to go and read the final passage from Desire of Ages, page 686, to find out exactly what was going on through all of that. Hope you've enjoyed our time together. We'll see you again next week.